Hi everyone and welcome to today's video where we are going to be looking at curated imperfection, what it is, why it matters, and how to avoid it. So in the past 16 to 17 years and the past decade especially, social media has become increasingly ubiquitous. It's, it's everywhere. And it's also turned into more than a way to just connect with the people that we already know. Platforms that were originally kind of used to connect with family members living across the country or old college buddies or a childhood friend that had moved away um, have turned increasingly into places of business growth and online commerce and most relevant for today's video, the whole social media phenomenon has given rise to the industry of influencers. Influencers, social media users with large followings whose interests range from fashion and fitness to photography, parenting, and of course, celebrities. And now, even your next door neighbor could be cashing in on the big business of being an influencer. Influencer. Influencers. Influencer. Influencers. Influencers cashing in on their legions of social media followers. 17-year-old mega vlogger Emma Chamberlain, Jasmine Brown, Brittany Dawn. They have agents, just like Hollywood. They have managers. They have publicists. Today, it seems like everyone is in a battle for the most clicks because a big social media following can mean big money. I mean, you're getting paid to be yourself. Yeah. That's a dream job. <laughs> And none of this is necessarily negative, and in fact, I think that there are a lot of really great things that have come out of this shift in the use of social media, such as the ability for small businesses to grow online. But with people spending more time than ever online, worldwide people spend an average of two and a half hours on social media every single day. So that means that it is more important than ever that we examine the role that social media is playing in our lives and how it's influencing us. It's been over 10 years since Instagram first launched and by this point, many people ranging from the platform users to the content creator influencers themselves acknowledge that spending too much time on social media can be unhealthy. And this isn't something that's just anecdotal, but there's actually evidence and research to back this up as well. Right now I am looking at an article published by Mary Sherlock and Danielle Wagstaff, where they explored the frequency of people's Instagram use and their psychological well-being. And what they found is that the frequency of Instagram use correlated with depressive symptoms, um, anxiety in general, and anxiety about physical appearance, body dissatisfaction, self-esteem, and so on. And that part of the study was just correlational, which means that we can't assume that it was the Instagram use specifically that was causing those. It could be that people who already experience those types of symptoms are more likely to use Instagram, it could be that using Instagram causes those symptoms, or it could be that there is a different variable that is actually causing both of them. So there's no way to tell from that part of the study, um, which is just correlational, but it is an interesting relationship to make note of. And then the second part of the study, it actually was experimental, so they deliberately impacted one of the variables to see what the result was. And so from this type of study experiment, you can draw a conclusion about what was causing what. So in part two, participants were exposed to a range of different types of images. And what they found is that when people were exposed to beauty or fitness related images, they reported significantly decreased attraction of themselves. So their self-rated attraction was decreased. and the magnitude of this de decrease correlated with anxiety, depressive symptoms, self-esteem, and body dissatisfaction. So they conclude that excessive Instagram use may actually be contributing to negative psychological outcomes. And then I also want to take a look at another study by Jin Kyun Lee, where they take a look at social comparison orientation, which they describe as 
quote, the inclination to compare one's accomplishments, one's situation, and one's experiences with those of others. So they say intensive uh, social networking site use could facilitate a social comparison orientation because friends' life stories and events presented on social networking sites served as a cue for social comparison. So when people were on these social networking sites, it acted as this prompt for social comparison to happen. And they found that social comparison was probably unsurprisingly negatively related to the user's well-being and self-esteem, and that it also had a negative effect on uh, their perceived social support. So none of this is particularly surprising, you know, just speaking for myself, I have just in my own life found that spending a lot of time on Instagram comparing myself to others doesn't have the best psychological impact on my mental health. So I'm not surprised at all by uh, by these findings. So that's just a baseline of how we can think about how the research has looked at social media and its impact on mental well-being so far. And by the way, if you want to take a look at any of those studies or any of the other resources that I'll mention later in the video, they will all be uh, linked and cited in the description below. What I've noticed and what I find really interesting is that when people talk about Instagram um, and social media in general and mental health, I find that people tend to focus on the supposed perfection that everybody puts on on Instagram. Um, I've seen a lot of articles saying how Instagram, the whole thing is like a highlight reel and we shouldn't compare our own lives to what we see on Instagram because it is just not true. It's not, you know, it's a small sliver of somebody's life. And a popular quote that I found that sums this up really well is by a minister named Stephen Furtick. And in a tweet, he says, one reason we struggle with insecurity, we're comparing our behind the scenes to everyone else's highlight reel. And I think that that's true for sure. I think for a long time that perhaps was the main difficulty with these social networking sites was the fact that, you know, it gave a really unrealistic, perfect kind of image to what other people's lives were. And, um, you know, when you look at that and then you can look at your own life, it, it feels, it, it doesn't always feel great. <laughs> And so that whole phenomenon of people kind of unrealistically portraying their lives in this perfect way on social media, I think we can refer to as a kind of curated perfection. And just to define our terms, curated means carefully chosen and thoughtfully organized or presented. And what I find really interesting is that I think that nowadays there is a whole new beast and it's not curated perfection it's curated imperfection so people deliberately purposely purposefully and thoughtfully crafting this narrative of imperfection. That term curated imperfection comes from a BuzzFeed article written in 2018 by someone named Laura Turner and the article was called Girl Wash Your Face is a massive bestseller with a dark message. And so this article was about uh, Rachel Hollis and her book Girl Wash Your Face and uh, Laura Turner coined this term curated imperfection to describe what she believed Rachel Hollis was, was doing with her brand and in this book um, and why it was problematic. So that term curated imperfection comes from Laura Turner and when I was saying before curated perfection, it was a play off of curated imperfection just to cite my sources. Um, and so you might be asking, why would somebody on social media, and in particular, I'm talking about people who are in the influencer industry, people whose careers are on social media, and in particular, the people who are in the motivational and self-help and you know, kind of coaching-like influencer industries, but why would they want to present themselves as imperfect? Why wouldn't they want to maintain this perfect image? And I think that the reason is multifaceted. And 
I also do want to say though that I'm not and nobody else is inside of anybody else's brain and so I don't want to project any motivations onto anybody. I don't know what people's true motivations in their hearts are, but I am going to be thinking about and looking at the impact of this type of strategy. So when you think about curated imperfection, think about things like little bloopers that people put into videos, a picture where they have messy hair and no makeup, or perhaps they're showing part of their house that's messy and you know they kind of just chalk it up to real life and showing up as real and authentic. And when I first learned about this term and this whole concept, I struggled with it a little bit because I was thinking you know, even if it is kind of aesthetic imperfection, isn't it still better that people with these huge platforms are not keeping up this perfect image? Isn't it better that they show their flaws and allow people to see that their lives aren't perfect? As I've thought about it more, I think that in a lot of ways, yes, it is really good that people with big platforms are you know, showing the real side of their lives because the people that follow them, it can, you know, possibly help them feel less alone or feel, um, you know, like there are other people going through the same thing as they are. And I actually was trying to see if there was any research done on this specifically, and I couldn't find anything about influencers and their imperfections necessarily helping people. I couldn't find any research on that, but I did find a Forbes article uh, written by Heather Layton um, talking about how influencers can play a really important role in helping to destigmatize things like mental health and that influencers by authentically sharing things that they might be struggling with can help bring those topics into the cultural narrative and help people make a shift on these really important issues. So I do think that that's important to mention, but that doesn't mean that the whole concept of curated imperfection is without its problems. And it's a tricky topic because everything that is online is curated. Everything has to be deliberately posted. So even if someone is trying to be authentic and real and they have the motivation of genuinely wanting to share that part of them for you know the benefit of others, even if that is their motivation, it still is curated. They're still specifically choosing that thing to share and so it's not the sharing of the imperfections themselves that is the issue in my opinion it is when that is combined with a couple of other variables and I'm going to go into what those variables are but first when I was doing research on this topic I came across a couple of great articles about curated imperfections so I just wanted to share some of the ideas that were mentioned there Megan from Ish Mom says, lifestyle gurus use curated imperfection to paint themselves as hashtag relatable. That means that influencers share their faults, but only small ones. Like, look at me with my messy bun. See, I don't even care about my hair. Or check out my stretch marks. Or, ah, see, my kid's room is cluttered too. It's basically begging followers to see them as girlfriends dispensing helpful advice, not actual gurus. It's an attempt to avoid punch-ups and criticisms. It's easier to criticize a celebrity than a friend, right? And I just quickly want to define that term punch-ups. So I believe that this is a term that came from comedy and it's the idea that if you are performing jokes and comedy um, it's better to uh, punch up at someone so someone who is perceived to be doing better or who is in power rather than punching down at somebody who may already be in a worse off place if that makes sense and so what it appears as though Megan is suggesting and what I've seen others online suggest as well is that it appears as though there are some influencers who are using curated imperfection for the purpose of seeming relatable 
so that you're more likely to listen to them. If you see them as someone who's just like you and shares your imperfections and who you can relate to, you're less likely to want to criticize them. And we see this even in the article that we were looking at earlier that was examining social comparison orientation. It says that the study participants were likely to experience negative feelings towards other social networking sites users who seem to be doing better than they were. So if someone online can portray themselves as more relatable to the average viewer, they are less likely to receive those negative feelings and criticisms from someone. So whether or not they are actively trying to manipulate their audience into being less likely to criticize them, it is something to keep in mind if someone is using a lot of curated imperfection in their content, particularly if the imperfection is especially aesthetic or just non-consequential. Okay, so as I mentioned before, it is not the curated imperfection itself that is necessarily the problem, but it's when it's combined with some other factors. So let's look at three different factors that I believe are where the problems stem from. So problem number one with curated imperfection occurs when an influencer is raw and real, but only when it doesn't really matter. And so to illustrate this point, I'm going to read a quote from a blog called the Houston Moms Collective, and this was written by Elizabeth B. So it says, when we are bombarded day after day with images of wildly successful social media influencers giving us a behind the scenes look at their lives, we begin to take those images as reality and not the meticulously staged, perfectly timed unreality that they actually are. Also, these images tend to focus on aesthetic messiness, dirty dishes piled in the sink, no makeup faces, children throwing tantrums, and not the actual pervasive messiness of motherhood that no one wants to talk about. When we compare the two, it's easy to fall into the shaming belief that our own messiness is far too much to admit to. And so this is the problem. When influencers share their behind the scenes look at what their actual life is like and the messiness or the struggles that they share are always aesthetic, always surface level and always something that's already been worked through, it can make the viewers feel like their own struggles, the things that are really, really deep and painful and deep below the surface are actually something that they're alone in because they're supposedly sharing the mess in their life, but they're only sharing a very specific part of it and not being transparent that they're only sharing that specific part of it, if that makes sense. And so it can turn into this very insidious form of subtle shaming where it's like, this type of mess is acceptable and okay and authentic and real, and this type of mess is not. And so while influencers sharing their struggles and their challenges and imperfections online can be a really beneficial thing for the you know global and cultural narrative to bring up really important topics, it can also perhaps accidentally have the opposite effect if the types of imperfections that are being focused on are very surface level and aesthetic. And I'm not saying that this is a really straightforward issue because I do think that everybody deserves privacy online and everybody is entitled to share only as much as they want to. So if they want to share a certain type of messiness in their life and not something else, especially if it is something that they're really struggling with and really working through, I don't think that anybody has the right to tell them that they should and that they have to share those deeper issues. But it's just this really tricky thing that I know that I've fallen into as a viewer of some of these gurus and influencers because it's almost worse than viewing the perfect content because the perfect content is sometimes really easy to see through. We all know that life isn't perfect and that even if someone is portraying something perfectly online, we know that there's more going on behind the scenes. But when someone is portraying the behind the scenes, but it, there's actually more behind the scenes that are behind the scenes that they are sharing that are not being shared, 
you know what I'm saying? It feels more dangerous because it's harder to distinguish between what is real and what is not. And to really drive this point home, I want to read a quote from that same Houston Moms Collective blog that says, the problem with Hollis's and so many other influencers curated imperfection is just that, it's staged. For every picture of a frazzled mom with a large following cradling a cup of coffee in a perfectly messy bun, there's likely 20 others on her camera roll that didn't make the cut for Instagram. And so I want to propose that we add on to that Stephen Furtick quote that I shared earlier to say that one reason we struggle with insecurity is because we're comparing our behind the scenes to everybody else's highlight reel and because we are comparing our behind the scenes to everybody else's behind the scenes that's really just as curated and staged as their highlight reel. Problem number two that I think turns curated imperfection into something that can really be an issue is when influencers portray the idea that all imperfections are in the past. And this is something that Laura Turner, who coined the term curated imperfection, actually talked about in that original blog post. She writes, the trouble with and the appeal of curated imperfection is the assumption that all imperfections lie in the past. They have supposedly been understood, integrated, and learned from in order to create a present that is blissfully free from earlier mistakes. And again, like I mentioned before, I don't think that anybody necessarily has to share deep struggles that they're going through in the present moment if they don't want to. I think that that's totally their prerogative to choose what they share and what they don't want to share. But when I think it turns into a problem is when every single imperfection that someone shares is used to craft this greater narrative of growth and development that they're using in order to try to sell you something. Whether that is themselves and their brand or whether it's an actual product. So there's a framework created by Donald Miller that I actually think is a really cool and really powerful framework and it's called the story brand and it's basically a marketing tool that has you use this framework in order to market something that kind of tells a story of transformation or growth or I think they refer to it as like the hero's journey and I think that that is something that can be really really powerful but when I think that the issue arises is when every single imperfection that someone is sharing is going into this greater narrative of growth that they're using in order to market themselves to you or market an actual product. Which leads me into problem number three, the final problem that I'm going to talk about today, which is... When influencers use curated imperfection to sell advice they are not qualified to give. What I'm talking about is when people are trying to sell advice, books, courses, programs, workshops, um, seminars, live events, anything like that, that they don't actually have the qualifications to do, but they're using the fact that their audience likes them, finds them relatable, and thinks that they understand their struggles and that they you know, are coming from the same place as them. They're using those tactics in order to sell these things that otherwise they don't have any qualifications to be creating. And just to be clear, I think that people are entitled to create what they want. And I do think that it's okay for people to share their personal experiences and their personal growth journey, even if they don't necessarily have, you know, the education that backs up what they're talking about. I do think that it's really helpful and beneficial and totally fine for people to share their own experiences. I just also think that it's really important for people to be upfront about what they're selling and about where it is that they're drawing the information from. Are they drawing it from their personal experience? Are they drawing it from uh, trainings and education that they have? Often either one is fine as long as the person who is buying the product or service knows what the creator's qualifications are. 
So an example of this that has been talked about a lot in the past year and the past few months has to do with the lifestyle guru, influencer, motivational speaker, Rachel Hollis, who I've mentioned a couple times in this video because it was an article about her that caused Laura Turner to coin this term, curated imperfection. And I'm not gonna harp on this for too long because my purpose here is to talk about curated imperfection in general and not necessarily to pin it on or accuse any one person of doing it. But I do think that it is a relevant example that a lot of people have been talking about. So Rachel and her now ex-husband, Dave Hollis, um, used to sell a lot of marriage advice. They had a podcast where they would talk about marriage, they created videos and Instagram posts about marriage, and they had this live event, this live conference that cost a lot of money to attend, where they would share their marriage tips and advice with the people who attended. And they would describe their relationship as an exceptional marriage. Those are the words that they liked to to use. And they were pretty upfront, I think, from what I've seen about the fact that they were not licensed marriage counselors and they didn't have any educational qualifications allowing them to put on these events. They were, from what I can tell, pretty upfront about that. So that's great. But the problem is that what was making people want to attend these events and listen to their content and purchase the things that they were putting out about it was the fact that they had this marriage that they they claimed to be exceptional and then just you know a few weeks after putting out more stuff about their exceptional marriage and their marriage advice they announced that they were getting divorced and that they had been struggling in their marriage for over three years and this isn't to say that just because someone's struggling doesn't mean that they're not in a position where they can give advice. I don't think that that's always true. But the problem with this specific example is that because they didn't have the qualifications in terms of education, they weren't licensed marriage counselors, they weren't therapists, nothing like that. They were using their experience as the basis of their advice and they were not upfront about what that experience actually was. More specifically, they were using curated imperfection to make people feel like they could really relate to them and they could really understand their relationship struggles and their relationship experiences in order to get people to purchase the things that they were putting out there. So in their videos and their content, they would have, you know, cute little imperfect moments where they'd kind of be laughing together or, um, you know, they'd have these like, kind of lighthearted little bickering moments in there, things that made you feel like they were people that you could really relate to and understand and that they would understand you and that they had this great marriage, even though it was kind of imperfect, they had this great marriage that qualified them to teach you how to have a great marriage. And it turned out that that actually wasn't the case, at least not for the whole time that they were giving this advice and selling this kind of content. I think it's also important to keep in mind that different types of advice work for different people because people are in different parts of their journey. And so it's important that if you are selling someone something, you are upfront about where you are getting that knowledge from. If you're getting it from your experience, you better be sure that you're being honest about your experience and you're not curating this kind of fake narrative around it or if you're getting it from training and education in some other type of you know accredited way of you know having this knowledge that you're sharing then that's fine too but you need to be upfront about where you're drawing your advice and the things that you're selling you need to be upfront about where you're drawing them from and I just wanna close out this point by reading a quote from a study by Katharina Pilgrim and Sabine Bonet Josco about influencers and the health and happiness messages that they send. So it says, the majority of the observed communication was intended to increase the personal appeal of the influencer in the eyes of the followers. The influencer consciously intended to create or increase perceived similarity between him slash her and his slash her followers, as well as perceived familiarity and sympathy. 
So in other words, the influencers were deliberately trying to increase this feeling of relatability and familiarity with their followers. And then it also says followers reveal very intimate details about their personal circumstances and express trust and perceived familiarity. They deliberately ask influencers who are perceived as friends for advice, react promptly to the incentives used by influencers and take their recommendations seriously. By using carefully designed images and targeted communication techniques, influencers gain the trust and friendship of their followers in order to strengthen their own brand identity through maximum credibility. So in other words, these influencers were using these tactics to make themselves seem more relatable, to draw in their followers and sell them things. You can see how someone who isn't qualified to give a certain type of advice could still be very compelling or convincing. Someone named Heather Milosic, who was a commenter on that blog post by the Houston Mom Collective, says, curated imperfection is just a sales angle. So the bottom line is that sharing curated imperfection online isn't bad. And in fact, it can be really helpful in normalizing the fact that life is imperfect and messy. And that can be a really positive thing. So I just want to emphasize that curated imperfection I don't think is necessarily a bad thing. It's just that it can cause harm when it's done in a way that is manipulative or that is used as an unethical sales tactic. I wanted to talk about this topic on this channel that is all about wellness because it's clear that social media is deeply intertwined with our mental health. And I think that this topic of curated imperfection is something that's really relevant in the health and wellness sphere right now. It's hard and I don't think it's super clear cut and therefore I don't think we should demonize anybody for trying to be relatable or for sharing sides of them that are messier or that are imperfect because I think a lot of times it truly is coming from a very genuine place. But I do also think that we need to keep a critical eye on this idea of curated imperfection because when someone is sharing something that is a struggle for them or something that is imperfect, it can be easy to blindly accept it. And I don't want anybody who is in the health or wellness space to get swept up into any ideas or rhetoric or advice that doesn't serve them on their journey. So I am by no means doing this perfectly, but when I'm creating content and specifically if I'm creating something that is revealing, um, you know, an imperfection or talking about a struggle, I ask myself three questions. And I think that these three questions could help you if you are a content creator who is trying to avoid creating problematic curated imperfection, or if you're just someone who is a viewer taking this in, you can ask this about the content that you're consuming to maybe get a little more clarity about it. So the three questions are, are the imperfections I'm sharing service level, aesthetic, or in the past? Or when I'm comfortable, am I willing to share more vulnerable and perhaps current messes that I'm working through? And again, it's not bad to share aesthetic surface level imperfections. It just might be a red flag if every single one that you're sharing is kind of aesthetic or is completely in the past. Am I sharing imperfection to sell something? And once again, this isn't always a bad thing. I think it can be a really cool part of marketing to tell a story of how you overcame something, but it's something important to be aware of when you're creating content. And finally, am I sharing something based on experience or education? Neither is bad. It's just important to be upfront about where you're drawing your information from. I hope that you enjoyed this discussion and deep dive into curated imperfection and that I was able to answer the questions of what it is and why it matters and how to avoid problematic curated imperfection. If you're interested in seeing more videos related to health and wellness, the online health and wellness space, habit change, personal development, self-care, anything in that sort of bucket, feel free to subscribe and I'll see you in another video.